Hello and welcome, or welcome back to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. My name is Joshua Gibson. I am your host, and uh, a bit of a, a different episode today. We're departing from our focus on youth weightlifting and uh, related topics to introduce something a little more similar to what we've been been discussing a lot recently, which is which is coaching. But even on a deeper level, it's like coach athlete relationship. Um, team culture, uh, gym culture, and, and trying to get a little bit of a better feel of how that kind of pans out in practice. Because I know, personally, I think about it a lot. I think about how we can organize our, our kind of team environment or team culture, which is what it is, and make it the most effective place for people to lift weights and improve as, as athletes, but kind of on the flip side of that, as people, right? Um, and, and that's why I think so many people are drawn to weightlifting. It's not necessarily just what it, what it offers from a, a physical, uh, a physical development perspective, but also the, the psychosocial stuff. So who better than someone who de has developed one of the biggest weightlifting teams in the, in the country, I would probably bet that that's a pretty accurate thing to say. Um, at least one of the biggest gyms. And I, and I know there are a lot, there are a lot of gyms, there are a lot of teams, but as in terms of physical location and the number of athletes coming and going from that place, it's got to be one of the biggest. Uh, so I'd like to welcome on Chris Aminta. And I don't know how many people hear that name and they think John North, Attitude Nation, 2014, YouTube videos. But that's immediately, immediately where my mind went when I, when I heard the name. Uh, Chris, how's it going, man? It's good, Josh. I'm happy to be here, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. It, it honestly is an honor. And, and what better place to start than how you actually got into the sport of weightlifting and got to where you are today? That's a great place to start. The good old days of John North. <laughs> That's bringing me back. Yeah. Um, well, my weightlifting journey started, shit, almost 10 years ago. Um, like most in this new generation of weightlifters, I came out of CrossFit. I was a sport athlete before that. I played soccer, raced motocross, and wrestled, and did all that fun stuff growing up. And um, got into CrossFit, did that for about four years. And 2011, I got rhabdo pretty bad. And that pretty much ended the CrossFit career, and I shifted into, into weightlifting. My first coach was actually Bob Takano. And I was with him for a year and, uh, I learned a lot under, under Takano. I'd still consider him my mentor today. And I looked to him for a lot of guidance. Same thing with Sean Waxman. Even prior to Takano, I trained out of Waxman's gym for a summer and I was still like on that CrossFit kick and was going to his gym and, um, didn't really know the value of like what was right in front of me and mm. who would have known that I would have eventually gone, you know, off the deep end into weightlifting, but had a brief stand with Waxman. And then once my CrossFit stuff ended, I, I went straight into weightlifting under Takano after about a year, um, not anything to do with weightlifting, just personal stuff going on in my life. I decided to move across the country and, and try out something new. And so that's where I started with John. So I think with John, it was briefly after he left Muscle Driver. And there was maybe five or six of us in those early days. And man, it was, uh, it was a wild time. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't a lot of structure to anything at all. But good memories, that's for sure. Yeah. And before we, you know, obviously this, like you said, you've been in the sport for, for a decade and that, that spans a lot of, you know, coaches, competitions. Like there's a lot that fits into that, that 10 years. And, uh, you, you kind of made a comment off air, which I think I can relate to a lot of people can relate to, but you're like, Oh, I, I thought you were going to ask me like how often I'm at the gym or something. And you're like, I'm, you know, I'm here pretty much every day. So yeah. 10 years of being at the gym in the trenches, as far as, those early days when you were with say Waxman, Takano, and then with John, it's, it's kind of a question I like to pose to people um, who have had, you know, opportunities to spend time with coaches like that across their developmental lifespan. But what do you feel like you picked up from those earlier coaches and maybe things even more specifically 
Um, like I know when I listen to Sean, there are certain things that resonate. When I listen to Bob, even with, with John, there are like things that resonate and you can kind of pick up on that help you figure out like where you're, you're, you're lacking or where you're doing a good job. So as far as your yeah. development was concerned, how'd that kind of happen over time with those, with those coaches? It's a good question, Josh. And I, I mean, it's what I think about is the biggest thing that I learned from, from those two different time periods of my brief athletic career was just the broad spectrum of weightlifting style, technique, philosophy. I mean, you got Takano and John North literally on two opposite sides of the spectrum and learning from both of them, they were both extremely valuable in very different ways. When I got into weightlifting, I was like 22 years old and Takano told me, um, you know, at that point is like, look, you're a little too, little too old for this sport as like an athlete, you know? And I always came in kind of with that in the back of my mind that I knew I was going to transition into a coach and coaching is going to be my biggest contribution to the sport. Yeah. So with Takano, everything was, was the technique was very different. The very methodical approach to programming and to training was very different. Um, and it was great. I learned a lot. There's, there's so much that I carry forward now from Takano. Uh, moving to John, it was the exact inverse of all of that stuff. You know, from the intensity of the program, um, the culture itself, it was more of like burn hot, you know, burn real hot and, and then burn out. So, um, but there was a lot of things that I learned from John and like so many of us back in those like early 2010, 11, 12 days that were getting into weightlifting. John has a way of like getting people into the sport and his larger than life personality that resonates with a lot of people. And he was the only one that was doing that stuff at the time. And so many of us that were CrossFitters got into weightlifting because of those early Cal strength days and largely because of John and the characterization and all of that, that he would bring into our sport. And I, I have a lot of respect for that. You know, he was like an industry leader in that regard. And he really started to shift, um, shift like the theme of weightlifting from like this back room sport that was underground in the dungeon that nobody knew about. And he started to try to bring that out of it with this blog and his videos and just his, his personality. So he, it was with him that I made a lot of progress and not bashing John or, or his technique coaching, but it's, it's things that I don't coach now. You know, it's an entirely different uh, philosophy of, of how to lift weights, but those things resonate with a lot of beginner and, and novice lifters. So like I, I saw a lot of personal progress as an athlete with John, um, but really it was the takeaways of like how to how to think outside the box to try to grow the sport that, you know, I've, I've carried with me. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And as much as maybe I don't, or as much as a lot of people don't like to admit it, you know, John's seen a lot of success as a coach and an athlete. Bob's seen a lot of success. So what that tells me is there's something there on both sides. hundred percent. Um, and I think, as a coach myself and, and, and someone who, who lifts and, and tries to compete, it's figuring out what resonates with your style, right? What mm -hmm. resonates with what you care about, what, what you prioritize, and then figuring out how to like use those things and strip away what doesn't. So it's like you said, it's like the same thing with John and his technique. Like I probably wouldn't resonate with that. Um, but the way he gets people bought in and I was actually watching this video of a recent meet. they were competing at, uh, I think it was the freedom finals. So shout out to Rod. And John had like a bunch of the teammates kind of in this huddle and he was getting like a lifter ready to go out on stage and to take a, a, a personal record or a big lift for them. And um, I kind of thought about that and I'm like, I think about the way I approach athletes as they're getting ready to take a, a big lift or as they're getting ready to do something they've never done before. And it's like, mm -hmm. how can I become that personable? How can I, how can I reach down and, and help them get something they've never gotten before? Yeah. And I think John does a really great job of that um so obviously it's like okay well what can i take from bob i've read his book i've i've listened to him talk like 
I, I've listened to John, I've seen all of his stuff. Like how can we take what works and what doesn't and, and take it for us and apply yeah. it over time? And I think you've done a good job of that. Um, now, after the whole at, like John North kind of era thing, um, was it like, when did SoCal come into the mix or when did you start kind of planting your flag and weightlifting and saying, this is where I'm going to build a business, build a brand, build a team and develop something into, you know, what it's become today. SoCal started after I moved home from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and moved back to Southern California in early 2014. And then I started SoCal that summer. And when I started it, it was inside of a CrossFit gym. It was a brief stint inside of this gym for less than a year and parted ways from that ran my club out of my garage for about a year. So it's about seven and a half years now since SoCal started and the vision it's evolved and changed, but at the core it's, it's, it stayed largely the same. The biggest difference is back in those early days, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing at all. And I was only focused on, on just coaching and weightlifting and you know, the world that we live in, you got to, you got to have more to that if you want to make this your whole life. Yeah. I, what caused the initial change from say the CrossFit gym? Because I know, you know, maybe now people are getting more into the online space, so it might not make sense to have a physical location or some people see it as an opportunity to have a physical location in a mostly online space. But when you left the CrossFit gym initially started in your garage, Maybe you can talk about the reason, you know, you started changing places, but also what, you know, the development of SoCal was like over those years. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I moved, I moved out of the gym, uh, mainly because my, my business partner at the time, him and I, we just, we were so young and naive with running a business. We both had no experience and I can look back on that time now and think like, it's no fault to either of us. You know, we both we're in so far over our heads and I was super passionate about weightlifting and he was with CrossFit and um, you know, that was, we just couldn't figure out how to make a sustainable model work. And so that's what caused that initial, uh, you know, kind of separation where I moved the gym into my garage. The main reason that I moved the gym into my garage and kept it going was I had a 12 year old on my team that was exceptionally talented and he, he found weightlifting at a very uh, tough time in his life. There's a lot of personal issues going on with him at home and weightlifting was like his only crutch and he was coming from inner city LA area. So weightlifting kept him off the streets and I felt like I was playing, you know, a role in that. And to be totally honest too, like there was, I was at this weird point in my life in my mid twenties, trying to figure out what should I be doing? And should I go back to my previous career path? And this thing is making me no money. And like, I was lost. And so as much as I felt like I was giving him purpose and direction, you know, him and the representation of him and the club at the time, it was doing the same for me. Mm. So it was a lot of fumbling around for seven, eight months trying to figure out what my next step is. And I basically just gave myself a timeline. Like I'm, I, I have one more shot at this and then I'm going to, you know, wrap it all up. And so I decided the first thing I need to do is get the club out of my garage. Cause it's not, it's not growing at all. And I had zero online presence and um, you know, it was, Long, way before remote coaching really started to pick up. So I started renting space from another CrossFit gym that was like down the road. And that's where things started to pick up. The first major addition was um, my, my wife was, that's where she joined SoCal, originally came on board as just an athlete and quickly realized that like what I'm, what I'm doing is, there's something here and I'm super passionate about this, mm -hmm. but we need some more structure. We need some more organization. 
And so she came in and she started to provide those things. And those first six months inside of this now third location of SoCal, uh, that's where things really started to grow. And we went from about five weightlifters to 35, 40 athletes inside this CrossFit gym, just with doing like simple, basic uh, business practices and just being organized and being consistent. So in that time, as we grew, we ran our first competition mm-hmm. and that went super successfully. That kind of allowed us to leapfrog into the location we're into now. And so at the end of 2016, we found this CrossFit gym that was going out of business, we worked worked to deal with them and then moved the club into the space that we're in now. And so we've been here for a little over five years. When we started, we had probably about 25 CrossFit type members and then which we absorbed they were members here of the gym before us and then we brought in like our 35 weightlifters so over the last five years we've grown it now to where i think we checked this morning we're sitting a little over 140 weightlifters and total gym memberships just shy of 200. wow that's um that's quite the transition right so it's like garage inside of a crossfit space and then like this massive facility. Um, and I was, I was talking to Allie, she made the the trek out there and was lifting it. And she just talked about like how, how huge it was and how many people were like able to lift and, and manage within that space. Um, how did you evolve over time? Right. So you talk about the space evolving, getting more athletes. It's like the pressure is on them to develop. And then the pressure, you know, the pressure is on you to develop as well and to maintain kind of like the quality as the business grows, you know, yeah. uh, for the athletes, how, how were you able to do that? I mean, like, how did you invest in yourself to invest in SoCal? Good question. We got this thing here that we always talk about how, uh, like leadership starts with learning how to lead yourself and you need to know how to lead yourself before you can really lead others or lead an organization. So those initial couple of years, I think a lot of it was like, obviously passion, hard work, timing, and some luck that just really started to grow the business. And in a way it was almost on this, uh, like a house of cards because mm-hmm. my leadership skills and my ability to lead myself and lead others was just not in place. And so we had after that first year of just like learning and getting our feet settled, then we really started to see a push up in membership and growth. And that it was after that second year, 2000, it was about 2018 where the wheels kind of fell off and I had to have that hard look in the mirror and ask myself, like, how are you showing up? What kind of leader are you? And so I really started to dig deeper into, um, things like having the discipline to, to manage yourself, your schedule, make the uh, commitments to your staff. And, and those were the things that started to just, they were, it was nothing major. Like there was no secret thing. And I think that people search for this too much. All it really is, is just uh, like consistency over time and taking small steps and trying to make, your problems as simple as possible. So you can, you can tackle those problems one at a time and slowly build over time and just be consistent with that. And it took us some years to get it down over the, over the years, you know, my personal growth has, has grown immensely and that's led into the way that we lead our team and how our team has became, become team leaders inside of this organization. So it's been, Uh, you know, this very just consistent road for the last four years of just constantly learning and constantly trying to improve and constantly looking in the mirror and asking myself, how, how am I actually showing up? So it's, yeah, that's, that's been, um, it's been a fun time for sure. There's been a ton of ups and downs, but since then, you know, we, we now, I have four full-time coaches that all focus on weightlifting and, um, they, they've seen the personal growth in me and they could probably speak 
better to, you know, the changes that they've seen for me over the years. So, yeah, you just happen to be living it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a point that I was thinking about. It's, I was, I was talking to a, a good friend yesterday at the gym, you know, things wrap up, people leave out or people leave. It's kind of like you and another person. And you kind of have like, you know, those deeper chats about what you're trying to do, what, what the purpose is, you know, and it's hard to, to get insight into how you've developed, how you've made an impact. Like, because like you said, it's the small changes over time. It's the things yeah. that like what you see is kind of what you get, but what you see is also a reflection of like what you've started from and what you've gotten. And and that stuff is really hard to kind of, kind of get, get into and, and to actually visualize. Um, do you, do you feel like at, at, at the heart of it, you had the skills though, and they were kind of like buried in the sand, or is this something that like entirely developed through discipline, like having the right people in place or the right resources to develop something that could build a business, make a business successful? I think a, a combination of both of those things is what has I think, it, yeah, it's a combination of both. Like I think back into like my childhood and my teenage years when I was, you know, playing sports and what I got out of sports, um, it taught me those things and like how to be disciplined with your time and how to work hard and, and face adversity. And so those, those things I knew were in me in terms of like leading a, a team and an organization to this level, like that was all, all new. The, the key factor that I think has really helped me is just having like awareness of who you are and where you are and be willing to learn and be willing to know that like you don't, you don't have the answers. And what's funny is the further along we get, the more I realize I don't know shit and no <laughs> one really does. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you said it right, Josh, it's hard to quantify and like to put your finger on like, what were the changes that you did? Like, I can give you some examples in 2017, I was still training and competing and my life was hectic. I was training at 930 at night and I was training for two hours and, you know, and then not getting home and getting to bed super late. And my, my schedule was so offset. It was just all over the place. So once I kind of got to the point where SoCal was, was I really needed to shift my focus and, and let my own weightlifting take a back seat and focus on my coaches and my athletes. That's when I started to make the shift towards um, all those daily disciplines. I got super organized with my nighttime routine and my, my morning routines. I got on a you know, strict well, not strict, but I got on like a schedule of training that made sense that was in the morning and just started doing like those little things about leading myself, you know, and like the, they, they're so simple, but we neglect them all the time. And it started with that and it took some time to get to that. And then through that process, I've had mentors and I've had coaches that have helped lead me and, and, you know, stretch my perspective and stretch my thinking on on how to be a better leader and how to show up for your for your staff members. It's been those pieces that have slowly just gone gotten put into place. Yeah, and I think there's obviously a lot that we haven't necessarily touched on, but I think a cool like little exercise that a lot of people could benefit from given that people listening are, are either athletes, coaches, um, gym owners, or a combination of or they're just like my friend and they're like, Hey, I'm going to support you and listen to the podcast. Uh, so thank you to those people. <laughs> but what does your schedule look like? So from like when you wake up to when you go to sleep, like how do you structure that to, to one live like a life that's fulfilling? Like, let's not try to make it out to be some sort of like robotic yeah. r regimented, like, Oh, I wake up at 6am and I drink raw eggs and I play Rocky, <laughs> like the Rocky theme, theme music. Well, like, how do you structure your day? Like, what does that actually look like in practice? Uh, I get up between five fifteen, five thirty 530 every day. And 
take a shower, go to the gym. First thing I do every morning is train. Mm. And it just sets my whole day up. You know, I could, if I had shitty sleep or if traffic pissed me off or whatever, like that, that training, it's, there's been times throughout the years that I've lost that and got overwhelmed with business. And the first thing that goes is your own personal health, well being. So now I've, I've, bash my head against that wall so many times that I've realized, okay, like this is a massive priority. I have to do this and I love to do it. I, I love the benefits that I get from my mindset and my mood. So every morning I train at the gym before all my athletes show up, then we get into coaching. And so most of my athletes will start to roll in between nine, nine 15. They're usually on the bar sometime around nine 45 depending on how much Caesar's running his mouth and goofing <laughs> off. <laughs> and then um, they're usually training by 10. So our morning training sessions are when most of our national athletes are training together. And that just happened by coincidence. It's just a, a typical coaching hours. It's just the way that their schedules all worked. So it's good. It's a different environment than the evening training sessions. It's, uh, it's more focused. It's more of a team practice leading up to AO finals. They, they were all, you know, doing warmups together, uh, going through the whole training together, all that stuff. So I spend every day of the week, except Thursdays on the floor between 10 and 12, 1230. And then basically from 12 to four or 12 to five is like my work time. And so whatever that means, usually it's a lot of meetings, program time, um, athlete meetings, meetings with my staff. And then depending on what we have in the evening, I'm either coaching our youth kids or on the floor with the, uh, with the night crew. So all in all, I'm usually walking out the door around 9 PM. And then how do you unwind from that? Like, how do you then switch into this is taking care of Chris time. I listened uh, to, I listened to philosophical way with thing on my ride home. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, but even when it's about you, it's still about development, right? It's still about becoming a better coach, becoming a better, better person. Um, but like, do you, do you ever switch off? Do you ever feel like you can fully switch off and get away from it? Or do you want yeah. to? Uh, that's, it's a good question. Um, I get that a lot. You know, I think, I think one thing too, that helps is like, I have a business coach, mm, which okay. I, that's been like a, one of the number one factors that has helped all of this come together. And, you know, I find it somewhat hypocritical when a, when a weightlifting coach like doesn't want, you know, help. And they're like, oh, I don't need a business coach. <laughs> so it's like, you, you know, that role, you know, you're a coach, you coach athletes, you know, the value you bring. Yeah. It's the same. It's the, it's it's a different game, but it's the same at the end of the day. So I have a coach that's, you know, helped me along the way a lot. And he asked me those same questions. Like, do you turn it off or do you want to turn it off? Um, I look at it right now is like, there's, there's a finite time that I can operate the way that I do with uh, all the projects and endeavors that we have going on here. I know down the road, like we, my wife and I, we want a family and we want kids. And I know that that day's coming. So I want to squeeze as much out of this right now as I can and get these systems built in place. So once the family is here, you know, my life is set up in a way that I want it to be. So I, I absolutely love it. Like I love every single minute. There's obviously ups and downs and there's going to be days that are harder than others, but I have, no complaints about, you know, where we are and how much time that we dedicate. And I think what, what really fills my cup up is my staff and the athletes buying into this vision and sharing this passion for weightlifting, those things, it rejuvenates me. So when I'm on the floor and I'm working with my high level lifters in the morning and we're diving deep into the process of training, or if it's at night and it's more the recreational crew that's having fun and it's, it's a different vibe, you know, and I can spend time with each individual person and get to know them on a deeper level. Like those things, they fuel me. 
So it, it allows me to come in and look forward to being here 14 hours a day. And then on those times that we try to shut it off, like we do that. And, and examples, my wife and I, she's from Canada and we took, we took a month vacation in the middle of summer and spent a month up at her cabin and no cell phones, no TVs and fully shut down for four weeks. So we plan those things inside of our lives and that allows us to really keep the throttle down, you know, in, in the depths of training. Yeah, I don't. So this is a spoiler alert. I know the weightlifting house podcast has taken a bit of a different bend and he's releasing like a season, I think at the start of the year. And I recorded an episode with Seb and we actually discussed almost this exact thing where he, Seb actually ended up getting a business coach who, who he's been working with um, to help him develop, you know, the, the same things we're talking about. And I actually started working with um, Justin Holly as like a kind of like a coaching mentor. And it's a lot, again, a lot of it, it, it it's not like so much, you know, it's not how much you're going to price this thing for, or like how many sets and reps are you going to give someone? Uh, it's really like, why are you doing it? Like what makes you so like engaged, so thrilled, like what makes you feel the way you do when you, when you coach. Right. Um, and like we worked backwards, you know, during the podcast and just in general, like thinking about it and ultimately it's to just help people to be involved with people, um, to see them improve, to like, to give something that allowed you to develop so much to them so that they can experience it in their own unique way. And I, I know Chris, you and I have talked about that a little bit, um, here and there, but like, it's that same idea. It's like, okay, the sets and reps, you know, that stuff matters, but like, how can I help people develop, um, yeah. so that they can be present, be aware, be able to like live through the process. that's going to make them a better athlete. And then like ultimately kind of feed back into being a better person. So it's like better people make better athletes, better athletes generally will make better people within reason. Um, and then I see that, you know, from the, the business perspective as well, because business is just like, you see there is a need for something and you want to, you want to supply people with what they need or what they, they feel like they could use. Um, and you want to give people like a part of you, which is what I feel like you're able to do with, with Onyx and, um, you know, now Maverick and, uh, I, I would like to think about like the development of you as a, as a coach and kind of as like a, a, a businessman over time, what were like the most critical time points for you? So I know like moving locations and opening kind of SoCal as it is, was that like one of the biggest moments in kind of like your, your 10 years so far, or what were the moments that like played the biggest role into getting you where you are? Yeah, I can pinpoint it into three specific times. That initial period of just b basically eating shit for two and a half years, like that taught me so much. It taught me so much about myself and about what I need to do if I, if I actually want to achieve the goals that I've set out for myself and for, for this club. Like there's so much that I had to go through in those initial phases. Uh, the resiliency to go through that though, and to be comfortable in the most uncomfortable situations and like looking at my bank account, draining out every month and like, you know, eating ramen, like that was my whole life, but I needed to go through those phases to learn those lessons that it taught me. After that, the second major point was 2018, 19 was when the wheels came off the business and it was right with the introduction of Onyx into, into our gym. And just a short side note with the story of Onyx, the founder, Danny, Danny Ear, him and I were training partners back in the Takano days in like 2010, 2011, 12, that time. So that's where I met Danny. And I, as I branched away, moved across the country, came back, started SoCal, that's where he started Onyx. And he was making straps out of his garage. And um, man, from afar, I watched him and I was like, this is, this kid's onto something. There's just a cool vibe to Onyx. And, you know, he's super passionate about weightlifting. Him and I have always shared that. So there, 
fast forward to 2019, we partnered in with Danny and started Onyx. We started sponsoring USA Weightlifting, became the official straps, wrist strap sponsor of USA Weightlifting. And that was the first year that I started to really put athletes on every single national platform, yeah. including a youth kid that made Youth Worlds, Youth Pan AMs. Um, so everything really started to pick up at that time. And I was gone a lot. And I had like the, the personal leadership down, but it was the team leadership that I really lacked. And so the team leadership and the leadership of the organization, those two things tied together. And we didn't have the systems in place. And, you know, we lost a lot of members during that time. I, there was issues with our staff and it was all, you know, mainly revolving around me and my lack of leadership at the time. And so I had to have another kind of real hard look in the mirror during that time period and ask myself, like you, you may be developing as a coach and you may know how to program, but like, what are you, how are you showing up as a leader that's leading others? And so that was a big moment of reevaluation and setting the record straight with my team and then moving forward. The final element that has really tightened things up here at SoCal has been the pandemic. And I saw a lot of different uh, industries and teams across different industries, not just specifically weightlifting, but teams that either like dispersed or other ones that like came back together and like got even tighter and that nucleus got even stronger. And that's exactly what happened to us. Like the day that the pandemic hit and all the gyms closed down here in California, we opened our doors up to all of our members. They came in and they, they wiped the whole gym out. Every single piece of equipment was gone in like five hours. Mm -hmm. So we quickly within a day shifted everything onto Zoom. We had a full built out calendar of Zoom sessions and all the coaches were scheduled to different Zoom classes and all of our athletes would log in and they might be in their fucking garage or out on the sidewalk or in their living room and lifting weights and getting coaching and then our staff we started meeting every monday wednesday friday and we would do like these quick check-ins every single week and just make sure like everyone's good everyone's you know if anyone needs anything like i mean whatever came up you know we handle and we came out of the backside of that initial lockdown just so much of a tighter team and so much more alignment with the vision that, you know, that has been like this, the catalyst that really helped kind of push SoCal forward over the last year and a half. When I think you mentioned, you know, developing as a, as a leader, as a, as a person, and then developing the ability to manage a team and create a team, uh, create like more cohesion, um, like a better environment for, for a lot of people to thrive. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute, but looking forward and kind of play a little, little, little game with you looking forward. Do you feel like there's an area that could possibly be exploited later? So like those time points showed you something, you learned something, you were able to tighten things up, right. As, as a leader, um, as a team, and then as, as, as SoCal, where do you feel like you're headed or like, where do you think you could improve? Um, just like a quick little thought experiment about things you could do better. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Yeah. This is the fun stuff. Um, well, it's, it's inevitable. Like there's going to be moments that are going to come up. That's going to test us. And that's essentially like the whole game that we're trying to play here is, is build these systems and then push these systems mm -hmm. until they start to break. So inevitably there's going to be things that happen that right. take place and that could be um, culture changes to our gym or you know issues with athletes that disrupt our community it could be us growing and exploring other options like multiple locations mm -hmm. all of these things you know they come with risks attached to them and although i don't know what the scenario may be or how it will you know unfold I feel like we've we've been able to set this core inside of SoCal and inside of the team that's going to – it gives me comfort knowing that 
whatever's in front of us, we're going to be able to get through it. As long as, you know, the vision is, is aligned and the, the trust is still strong and the unity between the team is there. It's these pieces like our values, our core values that we live and die by, that we talk about with our staff, that we talk about with our athletes that are posted up in our wall. It's those core values in alignment with the vision that allow me to have the confidence to know whatever future hurdles in front of us, we're going to be able to get through it. Yeah. So it's almost more, uh, at this point, it's more so like a, well, I guess like from the start, it really was just a capacity thing. It's like, okay, as of now I can manage five people, like five athletes. Okay. Now we're at six. Like wh where do things kind of go awry? What do we have to sh like sure up? It's like, okay, now I can manage 15. You manage 15. Now you, you start a location. Okay. You can handle one location. So it's really just creating something that until you realize it's stressed beyond its capacity, you you use it until okay the point has come that we need to make a change we need to grow and adjust and respond mm -hmm. um so i never really quite thought of it like that but i think thinking back to what i do now it's kind of the same idea it's like okay this system of doing things you know programming on like a google doc it's like okay that made sense for like four people five people <laughs> and then uh, you know then it's like google sheets and then it's like spreadsheets built out now it's like macro cycle plans and it, it's like okay it's like things grow you figure out like you can't just skate by with shooting from the hip in a yeah. session unless like that's what it calls for and then like but you figure that out too right yeah you figure out with with really rank beginners their techniques changing so fast like i'm not going to spend time writing out a year-long plan no. um we're going to come in session to session and be responsive but that's something you also add to the system like you add that flexibility into the system so i, I never quite thought of it like that but it's really just like being just like with training responsive to the demands and the demands change and you respond and then it's like this back and forth yep exactly and i i guess thinking about what you have developed and you you mentioned you know values and, and you you mentioned a lot of a lot of things talking about ultimately what's developing the business but why like the branch out into maverick now like why, why the expansion just from something where it's directly impacting the athletes? Is it just something else to like, I, I, I don't, I don't even want to prime you for a certain answer, but why the continuous kind of like branching out from, from SoCal? Yeah. Well, there's, there's been a lot of thought into it first. I mean, the simplest answer is I'm sick and tired of buying rogue plates that break down every <laughs> six months. <laughs> so with 140 athletes here that are just beating the shit on my equipment, like I'm tired of plates that can't hold up. And so many people used to tell me like, don't worry about the plates, spend money on the bars. Cause right. that's where the, that's what matters. But God damn, man, I'm sick and tired of the <laughs> products that are made overseas that keep falling apart. And right. there's nothing in the gym that stands up to Maverick. Mm -hmm. So, Maverick's got this crazy history. It's been around for decades. I have plates in my gym that have been in that have been in use for over 40 years. So it that was part of it. Definitely frustrations with equipment that are out there. But on a much bigger note, which is in line with the vision, is we've decided to go down this road of like expanding into uh, different businesses that are living in the same vertical, uh, all with the center of the whole ecosystem being the athletes. Mm -hmm. So the bigger vision is to essentially create an ecosystem that is around our athletes. So, you know, what are, what are the struggles that athletes have in, in modern U S uh, weightlifting, right? Current, current era, it typically will come down to, um, the financial restrictions that an athlete has because of the time that they dedicate to the sport. So by growing inside of this vertical and having multiple businesses that all are in support around our athletes, well, then now I can start to slot these athletes in to part-time jobs that they can still, you know, pursue their passion and pursue, 
reaching their highest level in weightlifting and then also still be able to work and do something that they love. So like Caesar is an exa excellent example of this. When Caesar joined SoCal at the beginning of the year, he came in, you know, he super creative, all about the Instagram life. And so like he came in and essentially slotted his way into like this creative director role mm -hmm. inside of SoCal and inside of Onyx. So he has multiple hats that he wears here where he can, he can run the social media accounts for those two companies and he operates as a coach here. So he has a, a small roster, but I don't need to overload his, his capacity by giving him, you know, 30 athletes to, to meet a certain financial threshold that allows him to live. I can keep his athlete roster at a certain amount and I can schedule his social media time and his work with, with Onyx and SoCal in a way and do it around his training. So at the heart of what he's doing, he's still focused primarily on his weightlifting and then he has these other pieces. So the introduction into Maverick is that same, that same concept is have another support business that my athletes can then still work inside of these businesses and still pursue their goals. And they can work for a company that understands what their goals are and is willing to work with them on that, you know, work around their, their, competition schedule and their training schedule. So that that's been the vision from like day one is to create a sustainable model that I can develop athletes to reach their highest potential and do it in a way that they don't have to end the sport broke and tired and angry and hating weightlifting. So that's how it all, you know, has, has led me down to this road. At the center of everything though, Josh, is still the athletes. Mm -hmm. Like majority of my time is dedicated to um, coaching, programming, athlete meetings, staff meetings inside of SoCal. And I have like key players with Maverick, with Onyx and with SoCal that all help and all are aligned so they can pick up the slack in these other areas. And everyone is clear and I'm very transparent on this is where my time needs to be. This is where I'm best utilized as a coach, as a leader and protecting the vision, protecting the culture. But in terms of like the everyday stuff, those, a lot of those pieces, they go to the individuals that are part of Maverick and that are a part of Onyx. When did it become that, right? So again, I, again, the, I think the people listening to this are probably smaller scale, again, in, in a garage, in a CrossFit gym, maybe just kind of, they, ha they have their own, they have their own gym. Maybe it's not their full-time gig. Maybe they do something to support it. Uh, maybe they just make enough to keep the lights on and, and that's what they want to do. But like, what, what was that like uh, tipping point, right? If we want to talk like Malcolm Gladwell, what was that tipping point? that made it go from being, I guess, like performance centered to now, like how can we just provide people with a sustainable income so that they can train, right? So it's like so holistic. Mm -hmm. It just be even a step beyond um, providing the athlete with the best product, but it's like, how, how can we get them to live the lifestyle that we think is best suited for being an athlete or just allowing them to do what they love within the sport, which I think is incredible, right? Because yeah. looking back to it or looking back on it and even thinking about it now, there's nothing that I wanted more than to just be involved in weightlifting and to make money doing what I love. And I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do that, you know, to some degree now. Uh, but before, I wish I would have had a, an opportunity like this. And I think it's kind of unique to what you're doing. But when were you able to make that happen or to, to even consider making that happen? Well, I, I knew that this is, I knew that I wanted to dedicate my whole life to weightlifting. And I, I had no fucking clue if we go back to the beginning that I was going to be, you know, involved with leather craft and then now like plate and barbell production, you know, it. I had no idea what the road was actually going to look like. And I still don't, I still don't know what, where we're going to be in the next five years, 10 years, but I do know that I'm going to be in weightlifting. And so 
I don't, I don't know when that was. I think as SoCal has started to grow and we've developed our lifters to a point where they're now starting to hit some of these ceilings and the, the constraints that come upon an athlete at different times in their career and when they want to commit fully to this and they can't because of these limitations. As a coach that you know deeply cares about them, I wanted to help get through these hurdles and I wanted to keep them around. And so I wanted to start solving some of these problems. And so that's when it started to evolve into, well, if we start building this ecosystem, then we can help these athletes with that. So it took time, you know, when in, in if I look at a timeline of that initial thing, lead yourself, lead others, lead an organization, like it wasn't until I was in this leading an organization that I started to have a greater perspective on what are going to be the bigger problems that my athletes are going to face. So for the listeners that are just in a garage or just starting off, I think that, you know, you if you focus on the basic principles of, of having a code or, or values or whatever you want to call it and, and having a vision and then start working towards that vision in a very methodical, systematic way, at some point, you're going to reach this point where you get into this realm of leading an organization and your perspective is going to start to grow. And I remember there was, it was actually when I was in, uh, I was down in, where were we? We were in Ecuador for Youth Pan Ams in 2019. And I remember sitting at the, at the table with all these other coaches that had have, you know, been on these teams, you know, team after team, decade after decade, these coaches have just been around for a very long time. And I remember, I didn't say much I was because I was the young one there, but I remember listening to them and what I took away from the conversation was it's like their perspective of what weightlifting was and what it is and where it's going. It was so much greater than mine. I yeah. felt like it was like, peeling back the onion, the layers of an onion and being around these individuals. It was just like opening up my perspective on like, well, this thing is like way bigger than I thought. And like, this is so much bigger than the little world that I know of SoCal weightlifting. And again, it was one of those moments of my growth that like it started to stretch my perspective and understanding. And with that, it started to get me think, it started to get me thinking bigger. And so that's, what's kind of led me down to this road that now you know, Onyx, Maverick, at the center of it all, still SoCal and the athletes. Yeah, it sounds like it's been uh, pretty, pretty, I mean, obviously rewarding, but I, I don't feel like there's a roadmap for this stuff. And I think like USA weightlifting, that's just kind of like par for the course. I feel like in, in weightlifting in the US, it's like, flying by the seat of your pants, figuring things out, piecing together resources, piecing together information, finding the right network, kind of like inserting yourself into a network to try and latch on and, you know, get, go along for the ride. Um, is that like a similar thought for you? It's kind of like trial by fire and over time you just commit, you take opportunities. Um, and then if you fail, like that's, probably the the best thing that could happen because at least you know you tried in the first place yeah i agree yeah that's definitely i feel the same way the thing that i would add to it is just always have this perspective of learning and right. understanding that like where where you are like there's there's always there's always more to it and there's always more you can continue to learn and you have to have the courage to know i don't know everything and I'm going to go find those answers. And so like, I, I value the community of weightlifting immensely. And I try to take a very active role in that, you know, going to all the events, coaching athletes at those events, having the booth set up for Onyx, you know, connecting with coaches and learning from coaches and athletes. It's a constant search. And it, like, to me, that's like what being a part of a community is all about mm -hmm. is like, showing up for that community, supporting the community, actively engaging in the community. And, you know, 
going about it in a way that like it, it takes into consideration that, you know, you're not going to jive with everybody, but right. you know, everyone is still on the, their own journey and you may come across people at different times and you may have bad experiences, but if you keep this understanding of like, we're all trying to learn, we all want the sport to grow and we're all trying our best, then it, it just seems to work out so much better with that type of perspective. Yeah. I feel like it is, especially what I've noticed with weightlifting and with powerlifting too, is things are so tightly held together that if you do have like a falling out or you, you don't necessarily get along with someone, you're probably going to see them a lot. Um, so you have to be able to manage that stuff. One, realize like that's okay and then to be able to kind of compartmentalize it and say like yeah i don't really drive well with everyone but like someone drives well with someone else um so maybe if if, if it didn't work out for us work out with someone else or um kind of vice versa and, and being yeah. open to seeing that back and forth i guess distilling down the and you you've talked a lot about leadership values, stuff like that kind of ideas that I think are, are commonplace in a lot of really successful businesses, but maybe not so openly discussed. And that's one thing I've noticed with weightlifting is like, I know Danny Camargo is like really the, a guy you would want to talk to and listen to when it comes to understanding, like how you can value an athlete, what you're, you're trying to provide them beyond a program. Um, but besides that, it's not, you don't really see it formalized in, in things like values and um, uh, kind of, as you mentioned, this like process of develop development to develop people. Mm -hmm. What what are the values that drive SoCal and are they differ from the values that drive Onyx and Maverick and, and potentially anything down the road? Like more formally, like what are the, the ideas at the heart of all of this? Yeah, definitely. Um, th they're not different they're the same across all because it's really our core values or like the values that we believe lead to a successful, happy, fulfilled life. And so they're applicable to all three businesses. They're applicable from the owners down to the staff into the athletes. And it doesn't matter if, if, you know, if it's my employees making leather straps and belts, or if it's my athletes that are, you know, trying to prepare for, for their first competition or nationals or whatever it may be. The values from the bottom up, we've created this pyramid of our core values and they read in a way that goes from the bottom up. And so at the base of our core values is uh, personal responsibility. So uh, personal responsibility and self-discipline are like the two core pieces of the pyramid that everything starts with that, you know, having the personal responsibility and the personal accountability to uh, know who you are, know what you want, you know, be realistic with, with how you're going to move forward to that and having the discipline to do those things. So those two pieces at the bottom, they intertwine and they, they set everything else up in motion moving forward. So what does that look like at the different levels? Well, I'm, I'm responsible and I need to have like the discipline to uh, show up for my team and lead my, lead my coaches and have hard conversations when those need to be had and, you know, look at uh, everything and through that lens and knowing like where, where's my discipline at right now and how do I make sure that like I'm showing up for my coaches in a way that is going to help support them which therefore will continue to grow the business. So that's the, the base of it. As we move up the ladder from there, the middle is unity. And so the, the things that we, we have this chart in our gym, that's like each core value laid out and then what it means and what it doesn't mean. And the big piece with unity, it's giving each other the benefit of the doubt. And I think like in this day and age, it's so common to like write people off and like, blast them on, on social media behind a screen. And it's something that we remind ourselves every single day that we're here is that like, give each other the benefit of the doubt. So for my athletes, you know, you're, you're putting 
athletes together in this team training environment and not always is our personalities going to jive well together. You know, there's going to be ups and downs. Anyone that's ever been on a team has experienced that. So at the middle of this pyramid, there has to be this value around unity that's going to help keep alignment and it's going to help keep trust. And it's going to allow us when, when things do arise, we can work through them because at the end of the day, everyone wants to see each other succeed. So as we keep climbing up the pyramid from that, our top, top two are uh, pursuit of excellence and finally freedom. And so pursuing excellence, that's going to look different for coaches as it is, uh, you know, my athletes. But whatever endeavor you're after, like go for it fully and commit all the way. And so how is your sleep? How is your nutrition? Do you have a nighttime routine set up? Like, are you doing all the things that you know you should be doing as an athlete that's going to allow you to get to that stage? You know, if you, if you want to be a champion, well, don't start, don't think, okay, I'm going to be a champion one day and I'm going to get my way there. Well, then why not adopt the principles and the mindset of the champion now and then work that backwards into your present day. This is how I now need to operate. And that is pursuing excellence. And it's the same thing that, that I do with the work that I have here. Uh, it's the same type of philosophy that my coaches have. And we believe if those pieces of the pyramid are there, then that's what's going to unlock freedom. And freedom can be different things for different people. It could be financial freedom. It could be happiness, fulfillment. Whatever freedom is, it, the Olympic stage, it's these core pillars that need to be in place that's going to allow you to become the best version of you and to achieve the type of life that you want to have. We just use weightlifting as that vehicle to do those things. Yeah. So what, for you though, what does freedom look like? Putting an athlete on an Olympic stage. <laughs> yeah. Is that, 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 that's the ultimate pursuit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's even bigger than that. I, I, was, I think I would not say that's the ultimate pursuit. Sure. It's, yeah. it's definitely a huge component. It's a major driving factor for me, but it's, to me, it's more about, uh, changing people's lives and changing the sport and, you know, weightlifting, I got into weightlifting at a weird time in my life and it, it saved me in a lot of different ways. And if you ever want to ask John North about it, you could ask him cause he knows <laughs> only <laughs> he'll know. Um, I know what I get out of weightlifting. I know how passionate I am about it and I know how much it can impact people's lives in a positive way. I've seen it in the last seven and a half years, the whole system that we've developed here at SoCal with our, hyper focus on the athletes i've i've witnessed growth inside of all of my athletes and i've seen the impact it's left on their lives so if i could take that and we can continue to expand that and grow and find more and more people and bring them into the sport that we're all so passionate about in my mind then everybody wins because the individual has this positive impact on their life and they become this version of themselves that they want to be. And I don't give a shit if it's, you know, just recreational lifting and, and using weightlifting as, as your, your means and methods of training and being healthy, or if it's, you know, pursuit of the Olympic stage or the world stage, it doesn't really matter what the, what the goal is for that person. So, if I can step back and say like, what does it all mean? And what is the main purpose? It's about changing people's lives and growing the sport of weightlifting and sharing the passion that we have with as many people as we possibly can. Yeah. I mean, listening to that, it, it's, it's one of those things for me where it sounds like you're trying to give people an opportunity to pursue their greatness um, and to pursue their, potential that that kind of exists in whatever capacity right like you said um whether it's like trying to reach an olympic stage or just 
training for the the mental health that it provides them with or or like that that ability to step away from i was actually i had a conversation with a girl about this today but the ability to step away from like the digital world and to just kind of be really present with what's going on um it provides people another avenue to explore their capabilities right um to, to push the limits in a very structured controlled way so you're providing you know that to a lot of people and uh, you know thinking back on it if you were to have a conversation say with with young chris back in you know 2011 2012 uh, when maybe he was in his garage or even before that what would you say you know that would have you know obviously you've, you've gotten to where you have today but someone who would remind you of young chris right what would you say to them if they have similar goals and aspirations um man what would i say i think first i would tell them that like just get ready to eat shit for a while it's gonna be it's a long long road like <laughs> You know, there's, there's so much passion that needs to be at the core and that is what's going to drive you and drive. I will take every day of the week over motivation because that shit's fleeting, but through passion, you can have drive and it can help. It can help be your North star and guide you. Now it's only going to happen if there's sales behind the shit. And to me, those sales is the mindset that you approach everything with. So if you keep this white belt mentality and you keep this awareness of constantly trying to learn and awareness of where you are and where you want to go and how to close those gaps, it's those sales that are going to help actually get you to wherever it is you want to go. So understand those things and understand that this is a very long process. You know, I look at this whole thing as like, like Warren Buffett's famous for, you know, building a business for, you know, that's going to live 200 years. It's like, that's the mindset that we try to adopt here. It's like, I want weightlifting to outgrow me. I want SoCal to outgrow me and turn into this thing that is, that far surpasses, you know, what I thought it was going to do. So going all the way back to the beginning and helping that new coach set their perspective up as a long-term game and like those stupid cliche things of like one percent better every day like that stuff matters it adds up over time that's all it takes it's just consistent repeated effort day after day making sure that you're in alignment with your visions and you you keep the passion and the drive going and then you have those sales that are nice and strong with your awareness, your learning, your perspective. It's those pieces that are going to help wherever it is you want to go. If you have those things in place, you're going to get there. Yeah, I think it. all these cliches, it's funny how they actually are true. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, because pe you know, people always, always say and you always hear, you have to love the work. And it's like, yeah, you realize quickly that the work is the thing. I think Dave, Dave Spitz has that famous quote, you know, after you hit a PR, it's like, all right, um, your reward is putting another kilo on the bar and trying again. Like your reward is like the work to get to the next, like next milestone, next level. The reward isn't the thing itself because kind of like you mentioned with motivation, like it comes and goes. I think if, if someone thinks back to 2013, who won? gold in the 94 class, you know, at AO finals. I, yeah. I don't know who would know that off the top of their head, except maybe Seb, yeah. uh, who's like the biggest weightlifting nerd out there. So that obviously meant a lot in the moment, but like, what did that actually provide them with beyond just the medal, just the, the brief moment in time where they were the best. Um, and again, that's like the work and then what evolves from the work. Uh, which is like those attributes that feed into other people, they carry with them and then they're able to enrich their own lives, which enrich the lives of other people. And it's, it's building a legacy that way. Um, yeah. so I think it's awesome. You're able to provide, you know, context to, to the, what I would call the legacy of like SoCal and Onyx and, and, um, everything you've done, which is really just like, try to get better 
work to do what you want to do. And eventually something happens, you know, maybe you don't have SoCal, but you'll at least have something more than what you have now. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I feel like, you know, on my show, I normally ask people to plug their stuff. I feel like with you, Chris, I need to plug my stuff. <laughs> that way people actually follow me because I probably have so many people listening to this from, you know, people who follow Onyx, people who follow SoCal, now Maverick. I'm just like this little old guy who's like, hey, you can follow me on Instagram at Josh underscore Phil WL. Um, but no, if people really do want to support you and support what you do, support Caesar, support all the great athletes, all the great employees, where can they where can they go? Um, check out the websites. You got SoCalWLC.com, OnyxStraps.com, and then the big one, which we talked about here a little bit, Maverick Barbell. And uh, for those real weightlifters out there that, that are familiar, Maverick Barbell, it's iconic. There's so much history behind that, that, that company. And uh, we're super excited to bring it back to life and bring these plates back to the market. There are undoubtedly the best plates. Sorry, Seb, if you're listening, but <laughs> our plates crush us, bro. <laughs> yeah. We're doing... So, I, well, ahead, I, do have a, I do have a quick question. Um, because I know Onyx, like the, the belt thing was kind of a big drop. Yeah. Um, now with Maverick, but what do people have to look forward to from Onyx? You know, Maverick is kind of running the pre-orders. They're going to start shipping out plates. I, mean, yeah. I think you mentioned bars. I don't know like the full details about that, but like the next six months, what do people have to look forward to? Because again, this podcast lives kind of the span of time from now until Spreaker goes down, yeah. Apple, uh, you know, Apple podcast goes down. So people are going to listen to this months from now. Yeah. So what are they looking into in terms of the future or what are they looking at now if they're listening to this a year later? Yeah. Well, the, I guess I'll go with one per each. So starting with, uh, with Onyx first, cause that was, that's, you know, where, where you directed this towards. Um, yeah, we did have the belt launch, you know, those wrist wraps have been amazing, uh, for when this comes out, minus Bodies that just popped at Worlds. Did you see that, Josh? Yeah, that, was, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're sending Bodie, we're sending Bodie a heavy duty version now after yeah. that. Um, so we have a couple iterations to the wrist wraps that we're going to be dropping. Um, we got these new ones called the Low Riders that are coming out. It's a uh, basically a combination of both the high tops and the low tops. So, low profile wrist wrap that's got the suede on it so it stays right in place it's a uh, the roller buckle from the high tops is a part of it so it's a little little more heavy duty it's kind of like middle of the road between our low tops and our high tops so those uh those low tops are coming or we call them we're calling them low riders and then after that we have one more uh, wrist wrap version that we want to build. And that's basically like a full blown meaty, mm -hmm. super strong bomb proof wrist wrap. That's, uh, uh, almost like the old, uh, ZKC wraps from back gotcha. in the day, but just use the quality of leather that we use and handcraft them here in the gym. So those are a couple of the elements of, of Onyx. We're also starting to look at expanding, um, the product line from weightlifting and actually start getting into dog uh, leashes, dog collars, everyday carry goods and all that stuff. So, uh, we got some big things coming that way for Onyx for, for Maverick. Uh, obviously I would just encourage everyone to go, go to the website, maverickbarbell.com and take a look at the plates. You know, this, this company has been dormant for over 10 years and we're bringing back the same exact plate made inside the same exact factory here in the U S it's the only American made plate on the market and uh, we're doing lifetime warranty on the plates. So if, uh, if you can go to the website, take a look and see, you know, what the story is behind Maverick in the history, follow the Instagram Maverick barbell. We're going to start, you know, we got this whole schedule planned of all these posts sharing the, the story of Maverick and what my last piece with Maverick and why I have like this passion for Maverick, it's, the company itself, like the plates are amazing and the bars are great, but the, the company is like a representation of like our history 
and our roots of weightlifting. This is a company started in the early 1960s and it ran through all the heyday of weightlifting. So there's so much history that's intertwined with that company from the founder to Takano and the athletes that Takano coached that took it on. And that interweaves with Waxman and Emmy Vargas and Nip mm -hmm. Din and Mark Canella and JP Nicoletta. They all share this in, in one way or the other, some connection to what Maverick is. So it, there's a representation behind Maverick that has a lot of meaning. And I'm super excited to dive into that story and tell people, uh, share that story with them. And then the final one was SoCal. It's, you know, we've been putting a lot of work into our systems here, uh, how we coach, how we develop our coach athlete relationships, the data tracking that we have behind our athletes. Um, so there's, we have some plans to, uh, to look at putting together some courses and uh, share with some of the athletes and coaches out there about what we're doing and just spread some of these things that have helped us. And if I can help a club across the country, uh, you know, move past some of these pain points that we got stuck on, well, then that's a win for me. So, yeah, those are those are the three main things that we got pushing along in this next year. Yeah, I don't know if you'd be interested, but um, something I did with Sean, something I actually tried to do with Sergey before he got like super busy. He was like in L.A. and flying around uh, the world because that guy's yeah. crazy busy, but um, it's bringing people on to look at like laid out annual plans and then kind of talk through it. So I don't know if you have any plans of like, you know, some of your national level athletes, but like within the system, just maybe doing some sort of uh, content or like video on like what that actually looks like, how you track these things. And I think just putting something to, you know, the words, uh, just so people can visualize it and get a feel for it because I got such good feedback with Sean Waxman's video. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be awesome just to get people across the country who, who have developed systems over time and, and say like, Hey, this is what we've kind of stumbled upon. This is how we do things. You might find some benefit. You might, you know, leave some things, but like, ultimately this is what works. So that could be a cool little, uh, opportunity, yeah. um, that we can kind of chat about later. But Chris, man, I really appreciate you coming on the show obviously and i'm sure people listening really appreciate it too because i'm sure they're just like you but maybe like five years in the sport two years in the sport maybe six months in the sport um and they're trying to figure things out so it's i'm, I'm sure it's really empowering to listen to a success story like yourself so yeah i really appreciate that well i appreciate you giving me the time to do it josh and i can't tell you enough how grateful i am for being a listener of this podcast like watching how much you've grown this thing and what it's done for the sport, like the guests that you have are, it's amazing. It's, it's helped me grow so much as a coach. Um, so, you know, thank you, man. Cause it's, you're doing your part. You're, you're, you're playing an active role in growing the sport of weightlifting. And I'm, I'm grateful for that as I'm sure many people are. So thank you. Yeah, not a problem. And, and once again, for people listening, if you want to follow me, you can follow me at, um, Josh underscore Phil W L. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on YouTube, but ultimately just keep listening to the podcast and we will catch you guys next time.